Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Emily Timpey and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. During today's presentation, attendees will be in listen-only mode. If you experience technical problems, please use the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel as we'll be monitoring that area, especially during the start of the pres presentation today, so we can offer assistance if you need it. You may also use the questions pane at any time during today's presentation to ask questions you may have during the talk. Questions will be addressed at the end of each speaker. So we have um, our two, this is the last of our three-part series on the Regional Climate Center overviews. Um, so we have Western Regional Climate Center and Midwestern Regional Climate Center today. Um, so we will have each presenter present and then we will leave time for questions after each presenter. So um, again, you can use the questions pane as the go-to webinar control panel. So first we have Nina Oakley um, from Western Regional Climate Center. Nina Oakley is Regional Climatologist at the Western Regional Climate Center. Nina has been with Western Regional Climate Center for over six years. She has a bachelor's degree in geography from UC Santa Barbara, master's degree in atmospheric science from University of Nevada at Reno, and is currently working on a PhD in atmospheric science at UNR studying, ex studying extreme precipitation and debris flow in California. Besides weather and climate, Nina enjoys surfing, paddling, mountain biking, and snowboarding. All right, so Nina, go ahead. Hi, thanks for tuning in, everyone. Uh, I'll be sharing some tools from the Western Regional Climate Center that hopefully uh, you'll find useful in your work. So we cover the Western 11 states, including Alaska and Hawaii, um, as you can see at the bottom of the, the screen there in our logo, logo. And then we unofficially share uh, Colorado and Wyoming with the uh, High Plains Regional Climate Center since uh, they have mountain characteristics um, like the rest of our region. And we are located at the Desert Research Institute in Reno, Nevada. Uh, that is part of the uh, Nevada system of higher education. So we're associated with the University of Nevada, Reno. So uh, just a quick introduction to our staff. Um, we're about 12 people at the moment. Uh, and uh, so we have some folks who, uh, who cover the uh, database management and, um, and station maintenance, and that's generally um, Greg McCurdy, Dave Simmerall, Al Mishra, who's, uh, who's new with us, and um, also Lyle Pritchett and AJ Wolf. And then there's a few of us that handle service requests. So if you email uh, for service requests, you'll typically get um, myself, uh, Dan McAvoy, or uh, Josh Walston, who's a PhD student with us and uh, helping out. So quick little overview of our, our team. And uh, I'll go through quite a few tools. This is a, a list of the um, of what I'll I'll go through today. So we'll go through each one of these, and uh, and these are generally um, unique to the Western Regional Climate Center. But some of these tools uh, have uh, capabilities to look at other parts of the U.S. So I'll start with uh, tools that are based off of ACES, and it'll either allow you to access data from ACES. Or, um, or tools for, for analyzing data out of ACES. So uh, the first one I'll breeze over pretty quickly. Uh, many of you uh, who are in the West may be familiar with the WRCC's um, co-op uh, station data access, which has been uh, switched over to work off of ACES. In most cases, um, this is the landing page for it to, uh, to find stations. And you can use the, the map to get at stations for um, for uh, anywhere in the US, and then we have quick links to, to the west below. And uh, when you land on one of these stations, you get a listing of all the different applications that are available for, uh, for the particular station you've chosen, and then a summary in the main area. And again, a lot of this is, is repeated in uh, tools such as XMASIS, but uh, this is what we have on the, climate, on the Western Regional Climate Center page. Uh, a tool that is we've recently developed and um, have still been um, working on, but it's in in operational phase at the moment, is called Scenic, the Southwest Climate and, Envir and Environmental Information Collaborative. Uh, this was developed uh, for the Southwest Climate Science Center, so it meant to have a target audience of um, of. Uh, uh, land manager types, uh, natural resources people, um, 
and uh, so it's it the tools were designed to uh, for that audience but there and it does a lot of the same things as XM and SCASIS do but there are a few uh, unique things uh, that I find very useful in Scenic. Uh, one of them is we have a station finder tool, a screenshot of that is shown here. And what you can do is choose a start date and an end date and a region um, and a particular variable, and then ask for all stations that meet those criteria. And it will show you for, for all the things selected what stations are available. Uh, we also have set it up to pull pan of operation data um, we've got a tool in here that'll look at for uh, for each month uh, or for various periods the number of days over a particular threshold. Um, so, for example, we were looking at for Reno recently um, how many over 100 degree days usually happen in in July, and so uh, this tool makes that a pretty easy thing to look up. Uh, there's also some gridded data tools and some abil an ability to make charts and tables, which I'll show you on the next couple slides. Uh, so PRISM data uh, is in here, and so there is uh, an opportunity to create um, some pretty nice uh, graphics from PRISM for various purposes, which is showing um, uh, precipitation sun for the state of Arizona um, for a particular period there. Uh, and then you can also uh, generate a variety of, of time series graphs. Uh, this particular graph is showing uh, water year precipitation for the period of record at Reno Airport, and it'll put on there the, um, the average in the red line and then each, uh, each annual value. Uh, and there's a lot of different modifications that you can do and things you can add to these plots within Scenic. Uh, so next tool based off of ACES, um, this is called the Climate Outcome Likelihood Tool. And we developed this tool to, to try and answer the question if we have, uh, and this kind of came out of the, the California and Nevada drought, uh, if we have some precipitation deficit that accrued over a certain period of time, what's the likelihood of recovering that deficit based off uh, the historic record? And um, so I tried to give you a, a current example. So I'll show you that the output of this tool on the next slide. I'm using uh, Glasgow, Montana, since they're in a precipitation deficit at the moment. Um, and this will work for any station in GHCND, uh, but we recommend using a longer station record. Uh, 1920 or better is ideal. The one I'm going to show you only goes back to 1948. Uh, and when you go, when you land on this tool page, there's uh, station markers for California and Nevada only, um, as this was the, the programs that funded uh, the, the project. But in the, um, in the G GHCN station selected um, box, you can enter an ID for, for any station. So looking at the output for this, um, what we looked at was uh, starting June 1st to August 7th, uh, what was the precipitation that accumulated at Glasgow Airport and how many missing days there were, uh, what is the precipitation deficit for this period, 3.38 inches, and the normal for that period. And if we wanted and we want to see um, how much do we need to to recover that deficit and reach normal by the end of the calendar year. And then based off historic precipitation, um, the 69 records in this period, there's a 1.45% um, chance. So very unlikely that by the end of the calendar year, we recover this deficit. And this is showing uh, the distribution of all periods from August 8th to um, uh, uh, December 31st in the historic record. And I can, and there's a lot of detail on the page about that if you, uh, um, need more information on interpreting this, but basically your, your summary comes down to right here. So uh, other data access that we have um, besides ACES at the Western Regional Climate Center, uh, we have quite a few stations that uh, we operate at the Western Regional Climate Center, and we have these, these data available in near real time. Uh, we have plots for the past 24 hours, uh, where you can view what's going on and the, um, and the most recent observations. And uh, we also have access to the historic data from these pages. There's quite a few stations throughout the West. 
And these stations that we operate are um, most of them going to Meso West as DRI. Uh, so if you're uh, familiar with Meso West, this is how you'll see these stations show up. And um, there's a link to uh, to these stations that we operate. Uh, we the Western Regional Climate Center also operates uh, the ROS archive, the remote automated weather stations used generally for fire weather monitoring. Uh, we also have the incident ROS that um, we offer in near real time as well and archive uh, those as well. And uh, there are a variety of things that you can do with the ROS data. I've given a couple examples here. You can do a time series of um, wind speed shown on the bottom there or uh, generate a custom wind rose um, or choose from some preset wind roses as shown on the top there. And the data that we provide from the ROS are hourly data. <clears throat> we operate some other station networks as well that may not have been covered in those previous slides and you can get a listing of, um, of all these different uh, networks that we operate um, looking at this website at the bottom here and there may be one that, um, that fits your needs. So, so a few other tools we have. Um, that are mostly based off of PRISM. Uh, the West Wide Drought Tracker, this is driven by the PRISM uh, four kilometer data set. And you can view with this tool temperature and precipitation uh, anomalies and percentiles for one to 12 month time scales. And there's also an archive for this. Uh, so these, these are nice maps to use in, um, in uh, you know, communications over um, social media or in any type of reporting that you're doing. Uh, so I've shown July here, which uh, for most of California uh, percentile doesn't work uh, particularly well, but you can get an idea of the, um, of the type of maps that are made um, from the West Wide Drought Tracker. And in addition to the uh, temperature and precipitation uh, anomalies and percentiles, we also have a variety of uh, drought indices such as PDSI, um, the uh, SPI, and SPEI. Uh, and those are available at a variety of different timescales in these types of maps. And there's also some uh, uh, tools to do um, uh, time series of both the temperature and precipitation variables and the um, and the uh, drought indices as well. Uh, another tool very similar to the West Wide Drought Tracker but has some, uh, some slightly different uh, functions. This is just for um, temperature and precipitation um, is WestMap. This is also um, prism based and uh, you can generate um, time series and, and graphs uh, based on a variety of different regions, state, county, climate division, hydro unit, pixel, polygon, etc. cetera. Uh, another tool that, that has been in development, um, uh, Dan McAvoy here at the Western Regional Climate Center has been working on this uh, along with some folks at Ezreal and the Evaporative Demand Drought Index. Uh, they now have the, um, the uh, these maps available online and down to a, a weekly time scale um, at, and they're available at Ezreal at this uh, address here. Uh, though we are still working on them and we'll have a Western Regional Climate Center version of these um, available in the near future. So stay tuned for that. But for the moment, uh, the eddy maps are only available for um, US wide uh, through this uh, Ezreal link. Another tool we have, uh, this is the uh, North American freezing level tracker. Uh, it allows you to look at time series of freezing level. And this is driven by the NCEP NCAR two and a half degree reanalysis data set. Um, so it goes back to 1948 and is on a rather coarse grid on a two and a half degree grid. So you're, you're limited in the uh, locations you can select. Um, and this operates on a monthly time scale. So this is looking at December, January, February. Um, freezing level at the point closest to Lake Tahoe for, from 1948 to 2017. And um, so you can see a general rise in, in freezing level uh, over, over time. Um, and this is, this is only looking at, uh, or this is looking at both wet days and dry days. So it's not isolating only the wet days. There's been some 
uh, confusion about that in the past, but it's a good um, a good way to look at, at snow level rise and, and uh, variability over in freezing level over time. Um, one other thing I wanted to share is our Western Regional Climate Center ENSO pages. Uh, we have, for many uh, locations in our region, these scatter plots that show um, the relationship between cool season precipitation and ENSO phase. And so uh, you can show uh, quickly show the relationship or lack thereof of precipitation in a Western location with ENSO. And we also have a variety of links and information. And um, as we, uh, I guess we're heading to the cool season again pretty soon. So as we um, move, uh, move into September, October, we'll make some updates to these pages. Uh, the Great Basin Weather and Climate Dashboard is a, a quick way to, to view information rel uh, relevant to the Great Basin uh, and to the West in general. Um, and this is a really uh, nice tool for stakeholders, very easy to use. You just click on the image and it pops up and it puts all this information um, that one might be interested in in, in one place. And we have both uh, um, observed data, uh, current data shown on the front page, and there's also another tab you can see at the top with forecasts and outlooks. Uh, we have a couple California specific things, the California Climate Data Archive, uh, which has a mini dashboard on the front page and then um, uh, access to, uh, to all stations that we have for California, um, all put on, on one map. These include the sub-daily and the, the daily stations. Um, however, it's, uh, it hasn't, we aren't able to maintain this and update it as new stations are added, um, so it's, it's somewhat static in time, uh, but it's a nice way to, to access all stations in one location. Uh, we also have the California Climate Tracker, uh, which lets you look at temperature and precipitation based off of PRISM. You can generate time series graphs like the one seen on the left for um, uh, water year precipitation in the Sierra region. And then on the right hand side, you can generate these maps of the entire state. Um, and these aren't climate divisions. These are special divisions developed for California to represent uh, some of the variability in the state at a higher resolution than the um, uh, climate divisions. And we are going to work on a redesign of this tool um, and potentially bring it to, uh, to other states as well and, um, and modernize the graphics a bit. Uh, another thing I wanted to point out, um, given the audience, is that uh, we do um, op we operate weather coder from the Western Regional Climate Center, and uh, sometimes we get a weather coder requests coming to our service desk, um, which is wrcc at dri.edu, and I just wanted to point out to everyone um, for for the best service and prompt service uh, with any weather coder issues, please contact wxcoder at dri.edu. They will get back to you much quicker and fix your problem. We'll just end up forwarding the message on, um, but if you need quick assistance, that is the, the place to go. And uh, what's brewing? Um, we are working on improving access to sub-daily data and having more um, uh, ACES-like web services for the sub-daily data. Um, we've been in the process of doing a server upgrade to, uh, to keep our pages running, make them more robust, and, uh, and be able to provide um, better services. And uh, we're also working on the modernization of the California Climate Tracker tool and hopefully being able to apply it to other states as well. So thank you, and um, feel free to email me with any questions, and uh, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks. Great, thanks, Nina. Um, so I wanted to remind everybody that if you guys have any questions um, about the presentation for Nina and Western Regional Climate Center, you can enter them through the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, so don't see any questions right now, so I'll wait another few seconds to see if any um, come in before we um, move to Beth at the Midwestern Regional Climate Center.
There's a lot of information there. So if you have any follow-ups, feel free to, to send me an email or uh, check out the tools and, and let us know if you have any questions. Yeah, for sure. It's a lot of great information. And again, her, there's her um, contact information on the screen. So if you have, think of any questions uh, later, you can certainly email her. All right. So um, we do have one question. Any plans to develop similar tools for Alaska? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. So uh, which, which one in particular, I guess, would be the question. Um, some of those things that I presented will, um, but the PRISM tools, I think we'd have to wait until, uh, I'm not sure what the current state of the PRISM for Alaska is. So, uh, but some of the things I showed will, um, will work for Alaska, but yeah, so I need to know which one specifically. Okay. Um, yeah. Don't see um, any more questions. So um, if that person wants to talk to you, or she can send you an email about um, any specific tools that she is curious about. Yeah, yeah. And we are, we do have a, um, a new staff member coming on in Alaska. So it's a, it's a good time to put in a request if there's something in particular for Alaska uh, that we can work on over the next year with, with our new Alaska-based person. All right, excellent. Well, thank you very much, Nina, and um, it was a great presentation. Thanks. All right, so now we are going to be switching over to Beth Hall with the Midwestern Regional Climate Center. Um, Dr. Hall joined the MRCC in January 2012 as its director. Her career with the Regional Climate Center program began in 1995 when she started her master's degree in atmospheric physics at the University of Nevada, Reno, with the Desert Research Institute in the Western Regional Climate Center. Her research began with the development of Nevada climate products for the local National Weather Service and WS Reno's fire weather forecaster. After earning her PhD at UNR in atmospheric sciences, she entered the field of academia, becoming a lecturer and state climatologist at the University of New Hampshire. Here, she gained a greater, greater appreciation for the diversity of not only climate across the U.S., but the funding, responsibilities, and roles each state climatologist has and how state com climatologists can complement the U.S. Regional Climate Centers and other climate services programs. Since joining the MRCC, Dr. Hall has worked closely with the NWS weather forecast offices across the region and has led regional road trips that allowed her and her staff to meet with over 22 offices across the region. So Beth, if you're ready, go ahead. I am. You can see my screen? Yep. All right, thanks. So as uh, Emily said, I'll be talking about tools that we have at the Midwestern Regional Climate Center, the MRCC. Uh, we've been around since the early 1980s. I think I found some document that we have our pilot site uh, from 1981. Our center is located within the Illinois State Water Survey at the University of Illinois in Champaign, Illinois. So. I'm not advancing, and I don't know why I'm not able to advance. There we go. Um, I'm going to start off because our most popular products on our website are in what we call the Midwest Climate Watch. And these might be very similar to what you would find at other RCCs, so I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it. But because of their popularity, I was going to mention it. <clears throat> because a lot of the products here are driven off of data from the cooperative network, they are some variation of temperature and precipitation. Users can go to these maps with a mouse, they can roll over the going back seven days and the map will change on the fly. They can get departures. We have snowfall information, um, data from the multi-sensor precipitation network to give a little bit more high density data on where the rainfall has occurred. There's also some a uh, little bit more unique, perhaps, products from the Midwest Climate Watch page. One might just be an annual uh, normal map, as shown here on the left, for snowfall. And then we have a variety of products that go across the central region. And one of the reasons why some of our maps are Midwest and others are central is because, from a National Weather Service perspective, 
All of our states, with the exception of, I believe, Ohio, falls within the National Weather Service Central Region. So we've had requests to try and expand across where appropriate. Here's a map that shows the date of the first 32 degree uh, Fahrenheit freeze, but also from the Midwest Climate Watch, you can see climatologically what is the date of the, what is the earliest date ever, the latest date, average date, um, and then also for the last freeze, and then we have for the first snowfall as well. I'm gonna move now on to Climate. Climate is our online data and tools portal. It is an acronym for the MRCC Applications Tools Environment. Here, users can log in, find their favorite station or by climate division, state, and they can display maps, they can download raw data, they can get value-added tools. So here's a snapshot that shows the ranking of precipitation for the Chicago Midway Airport. Um, you can also look at thresholds or runs or trends. So um, in this particular example, how many times have we had at least five days in a row of the maximum temperature greater than 95? Now we understand that with XMASIS, a lot of the Weather Service probably has access to similar products. So if one goes to Climate, um, in the far left navigation panel at the bottom, there is a thing for help and then product guide for the National Weather Service. This is a PDF file that essentially goes through all of the tools that you can find on Climate, but we've highlighted in red those that are not in Eximasis or that we're not aware in Eximasis. This um, PDF was last updated in February of this year, so it's possible that something new will have been added, but we do encourage particularly weather service people to check this out because it's not just Eximasis, there's a lot of other things there. You can see we offer Peach Byram Drought Index um, information, seasonal data, annual data. <clears throat> we have a whole section. Hey, on hey Beth, power. sorry to sorry to uh, to interrupt you. Can you put your screen in full screen mode? I think we see practice um, screen. Oh, I am in full screen. I just don't know how to. What about that? Yeah, that's better. Okay, I was a dual Thank monitor. You, sorry. Phone. Thanks for letting me know. Yeah. All right, so um, hourly data, you see that the last couple of selections on here through Climate, um, we don't think are in XMASIS, so I encourage you to check out this list and then go to the tools and play around with them and see if there's any that could help uh, information for you. Um, just to highlight, in the um, sake of time, I can't go through all those things that aren't in XMASIS, but one of the products that we're pretty excited about is what we call interpolated station data maps or customizable maps. On the input page, and this is a fairly common input page for many um, things on Climate, uh, you can pick your date so you aren't restricted to just the last seven or 30 days of this month. You can actually pick a few days. So if you want to do case study analysis, if you want the map to be for a region, and we have all of the RCC regions, we have the, Net the, the National Weather Service regions, there's some uh, wildfire designated regions in there. Um, the National Climate Assessment regions are in there if you want to do it by state. We even offer the capability, so if you want to display a map that is for a particular county warning area at the National Weather Service, you can do that. One of the things that is nice about this tool is you can decide which data networks you want to have go into that map. I'm going to step back. Um, you could default to just let's throw everything in there that we have that um, I believe is in ACES at this moment that it's grabbing it from. But users have commented because you see on the far right we have Missouri Mesonet. We hope to get other Mesonet data in there because right now just on a basic um, tool you don't really have that ability to turn on and off. For things like precipitation it's nice if you want to include Coca Ross data with co-op or not. Uh, you can do whatever version of that product you want, actual values, departures. And then the last thing is fairly nice because you can turn on and off county lines, labels, interstates, and we even have the capability if users want to draw the county warning area outline. So the next map is just an example of what one of those would be where it's a departure from normal for temperature. And you can see we've been a bit cooler than normal. Uh, this 
these last couple of days, but you can see how it shows the outline for the county warning area. Another tool that we have through Climate that is a little bit new, though Nina pointed out that they have a capability like this at the Western Regional Climate Center. And in fact, we borrowed the code from the WRCC because the WRCC and MRCC have been partnering on the development of that sub-daily database that, or data set that we were talking, that she was talking about. But here again, with the input page, in addition to picking what period that you want to use to display a wind rose, you can even do sub intervals. So if you want particular hours within the date, if you want to start it within certain months, um, you can do your units, percentages, uh, calm threshold. And then there's this nice feature where you can even filter based on certain elements. So in this case, I said, well, I only want to see a wind rose for the situations when the average air temperature was between 50 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And then the output is a nice graphic, and then I didn't include it in this slide, but you can also see the tabular output of what goes into this graphic. All right, moving on to another topic. We do have a um, native mobile uh, app that we developed. So in both uh, Apple and Android apps, it's called the Weather Almanac, with weather being WX. This is actually a version, we had created a tool on our website that was called Weather on Your Birthday. And the user could go in and they could find the station closest to where they were born. They could then go to the date that they were born and it would give them a nice climate summary. Uh, we didn't want to use Weather on Your Birthday because we found over the years that you could use this for weather on your wedding day, weather on the day that you moved to the United States and so forth. So um, the the mobile app is kind of nice because it can just go back and pull out what were the conditions on a particular day to the particular location. And it's free. It won't cost. Now moving on to a little bit larger projects um, that the MRCC has done. <clears throat> the first is the Vegetation Impact Program. And I'm starting with this one because it was really inspired by National Weather Service offices. I was contacted by um, two different offices in the region that had no idea that the other one was contacting me that said they were asking for a way that would perhaps improve communication between weather service offices on what their intention was in terms of are they going to start issuing um, freeze alerts, frost alerts, or are they going to suspend it for the season because they've gone into winter. So the outcome of that is we have a variety of static maps that can be displayed and monitored, they're updated daily. This is, you can see the screenshots here I've taken all the way back from 2013, but they're just examples. So how many days since the most recent hard freeze? And that could be important because if it's been a significant number of days, one might assume that, well, the, temp, the vegetation is thinking it's warm enough, they can come out and start to grow. And if they grow, that means they could be susceptible to a freeze. Um, we have accumulated growing degree days since the most recent hard freeze, since just a 32 degree temperature, since particular date. And then number of days with a minimum temperature greater than that over the past two weeks. Because again, all of these products could give an indication of whether or not vegetation has started to come out. These are spring tools. We also offer a suite of fall-based tools because a lot of times with um, harvest, if they wait too long to um, harvest the food, they could risk having an early season freeze come through and then the farmers will have lost a lot of their yield. Um, the, this is a weather service intended project. We'd always try and bring in more state climatologists and extension specialists, but we have several input forms. The first one that was intended to improve guidance across the region um, is where a user can go into the form once they um, sign in to go into the form, it automatically fills in who they are, their contact information, and what group they're from. But the gist of this form is for them to say either yes, no, or maybe, and that statement is answering whether or not vegetation is um, around that could be susceptible to a freeze. So they aren't stating on these forms if they're going to issue any sort of freeze alert at that moment. They're really just stating what they're seeing in terms of susceptibility so that should the forecast say there's going to be freezing temperatures, should they try and coordinate with other offices, should they be issuing alerts or not. 
But the Vegetation Impact Program includes other products in addition to just the Frost Freeze Program. And so I'm going to show a series of maps for that. The first one is a stress degree tool. And this is intended for corn stress that when the temperatures get too high, the plant itself shuts down. So uh, we had requests from users across the region that wanted to have some sort of monitoring map because if the number of stress degree days exceed a certain threshold, this will be an indicator of yield loss. Now for us, when we can certainly come up with the algorithm, take the algorithm and create the map, but as climatologists, we're curious to see, but how does this compare to what normally happens? So with all these products, we do um, provide what is the actual situation. And so I grabbed these maps just yesterday and you can see that they're relatively cool over the Corn Belt region of the Midwest. Putting that in a climatological um, perspective, that means that this year has been um, a bit cooler. We haven't had many days that were over that 86 degree threshold. Another tool is for the Keech Byram Drought Index. This is a very short, fast responding drought index. So it's a bit different than the more popular Palmer Drought Severity Index or the um, Standard Precipitation Index. It was originally designed most popular within the wildfire community because it can respond fast. So for grasses, you might get a good indication. So again, we show what the accumulated value is of the KBDI, which is how it's intended to be used. And then we put whatever that value is into climatological perspective for that date. So you can see again across the Midwest um, as of August 3rd, that that hasn't been very dry at all. Um, the blue indicates not very dry. And then the last product I wanted to show you is accumulated chilling hours. Chilling hours is a parameter that's used for tree fruit, for the most part, or stone fruit. The idea is, is you have perennial plants that grow fruit, and they need so many ideal cool temperatures throughout their dormant season. And um, once they hit that sweet spot of so many hours, and in this case, we've used the temperatures of 35 to 45. So we try and accumulate how many times there's how many hours in the dormant season there were that fell within that threshold, then we accumulate it. And um, vegetation experts know that each fruit has a certain threshold that is ideal, that if it's hit, say, 800 accumulated chilling hours, you can expect really good yield. What's odd, though, is because you have a range, when you put this into departure perspective and you're above or below, you don't know if that's because the temperatures during the dormant season were warmer than that range or cooler than that range. So we still provide the departure, but I don't know how much people use it. Moving on to another project that we have is our regional mesonet project, or RMP. There's a lot of mesonet programs across the Midwest, and they have been struggling often financially to sustain the support, uh, support so that they can continue operating their network. And so I've been working with them, the MRCC has been working with them to try and continue to promote the value of what their mesonets provide from a more regional perspective. And that way they're not just limited to people funding them from within their states. We're hoping that we'll find more regional um, supporters that will continue to support their data networks. However, word got out, and it was just a Midwest thing, but other mesonets around the country are starting to hear of the different tools that we've created. And so I don't know, I imagine that this will be an expanding project. At the moment on our webpage, you could see um, four inch soil temperature. These two examples is under bare ground and under sod. You can see that not every data uh, mesonet actually measures that parameter. So there are quite a bit of spatial gaps. Where we can, we will supplement with some information from co-op sites, so not all co-op sites have that parameter. We don't know if it's under bare or sod. Um, however, we also do potential evapotranspiration, and so you can see this map is a little bit more filled in because we have augmented the gaps where there's no mesonet data with rod data. And so when you are able to supplement, you can get a much better coverage. Another product that we do that is national in scope is the Accumulated Winter Season Severity Index, or the Aussie. <clears throat> this is an index that Barb May Bousted out of the Omaha Weather Service Office has worked on with Steve Hilberg, who is the former director here at the MRCC. 
And it's essentially uh, an index that is accumulated daily that looks at temperature, snowfall, and snow depth. And based on which categories or how much or where those values fell within those parameters, it accumulates so many units each day. And so users can monitor maps, and then we can also display uh, time series by the station to see how the current winter is in comparison to the climatological record. Here's an example of the Chicago site for this last winter, and you can see where we take the climatological data so we know what the um, most extreme, the, the highest Aussie winter was, um, obviously zero could be the lowest. They divide all those climatological years into quintiles or five, five um, regions or areas, categories. And then I think in this case, this heavy blue line showed what actually happened during this last winter season. We are getting funding to augment this tool so that users can turn on, turn on and off different years. So if they perhaps remember that 1978-79 was a very bad year and it's not displayed on their particular station, they'll be able to turn that on and off. I think we'll also be adding a bit more stations because I think this is the most recent one and we do have some stations in Alaska. So people are always wanting us to add more sites. Um, <clears throat> we, the MRCC was also the host for the Climate Data Modernization Project, or CDMP, where we collected data from a bunch of different uh, military forts back in the 1800s, where they had archived the weather conditions by hand. And so the, that data was digitized and then quality controlled. They didn't get through all the stations. The funding for the project had run out. But you can see on this map, it shows the stations that have been processed and QC'd. And the color coding is an indication of how far back the weather data goes. So if you're ever interested in looking at data prior to the traditional 1895 start date, we do have data for a whole bunch of stations across the US that you can see go back even to 1816. And there is metadata that goes with it, like the map on the right shows where that station was originally located and if it was moved. For health purposes, we have a funded project that examines West Nile virus. Now, currently, this is just for Illinois and climate divisions with Illinois, but there's been a strong correlation between temperature and precipitation. And when the particular species of mosquito emerges, that tends to carry the West Nile virus. So we work with um, mosquito modelers, I'll call them, I'm sure they have a much fancier name, who understand more about the mosquito, and then we build models with them so that we can be monitoring the conditions uh, real time and also have a climatological perspective so that we have a much better understanding of when we expect that species of mosquito to emerge in different locations across the state so that the state can take action to try and spray or minimize those mosquitoes to reduce that threat. And then the final project or product that I wanted to tell you guys about is relatively new. We've been working on it for about two years. And this is a binational effort between um, ECCC, so Environment and Climate Change Canada, and the United States. And this was driven because the Great Lakes are lakes that are, for the most part, shared between the two countries, and they're a major hydrological source of water for both countries. And they have lots of policies across these states where they need to monitor how much rain has fallen, how much each country has taken water out. So they need really good high resolution um, precipitation data so that they can incorporate that into their models. Canada uses a data set called CAPA, the Canadian Precipitation Analysis, and it's a combination of modeled data and observations. The U.S., and that covers all of North America, you can see just in this one example, it goes into the U.S. and even into Mexico. The U.S., their um, dominant high-resolution precipitation data set is that multispectral, and it does go into Canada a little bit, but not a lot, and same with um, Mexico. So the proposal was, well, what if we merged the data? And you can see because these are from the same date timestamp that there are subtle differences between what the MPE data set is reporting 
and the Kappa data set. So they came up with algorithms that could merge the two data sets. So instead of having to compare and contrast two, they can now work with one. So um, what we've done is we've taken those algorithms, we've developed the merge data set between the two countries that they're being provided, and now users can go to this website and they can display through a GIS interface, I meaning they can pan around, zoom in, put on layers, um, what the precipitation is, but then they can also download the raw data grids for that date, that time period, and I think we're archiving it back to about 60 days. So, I think that's the end of my presentation is a bunch of these random pictures fly up. I'd be happy to entertain any questions if people have any. Great. Thanks, Beth. That was really interesting with the U.S. and Canada's collaboration there. That's awesome. Um, so, again, a <laughs> Again, a reminder to everyone, if you have any questions for Beth and the Midwestern Regional Climate Center, please enter them now through the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, we don't have any questions right now, so again, I'll give um, everyone another few seconds to enter any questions that they have. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any at this time, so um, we will start wrapping up our webinar. So I want to thank both Nina and Beth for presenting on behalf of their climate centers today. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending and participating in the presentation. Um, give us a few days, and we'll have the material from today's seminar, including the recording, posted online. So thank you again for your participation, and this concludes the webinar.